short, man. He cut that short. <laughs> you just witnessed a masterpiece. In my opinion, a masterpiece. <laughs> And it's great for me to be here. This is really an honor. Um, Bradley paid for me. I just want to be up front. Of <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Okay, you should, you should get some help. Um, but honestly, I think this film is an extraordinary achievement. And Woo! it's been yeah. nominated for seven Oscars, for seven BAFTAs. But I think most pertinent tonight for two Screen Actors Guild Awards. The best actor. because we're just all actors here and I think Kerry and Bradley you've achieved something not only in this film but in your in your careers something so extraordinary I think you're two of the best actors working today and yeah and I know you both well enough to know how humble you are but I think it'd be really great Bradley I've known you for many years and I've been through this process with you and I saw early screen tests with Kerry Four years ago it was, I think, that first screen test that you did. Um, and it's been six years for you, Bradley, right, with the film? And so I know a lot of the ins and outs, and I just am dying for you guys to hear some of it, because I think as we know, as actors, there's so much work that goes involved to make something look so effortless and something so transformative. And if it's okay with you guys, I'd like to just look under the hood a little bit. I'd love you to talk about your process a little bit. And I'm going to start with you, Kerry. Um, and I think it's pertinent also to say that not only are you two of the great screen actors alive, you're both incredible stage actors as well. Yeah. And if I could gush a little bit, Kerry, because Bill Nye to me is my in top three stage actors of all time that I've ever seen. And so when I saw you in Skylight, I was like, yeah. Oh my God, how do you match Bill Nye? But Harry Mulligan, not only match, you were extraordinary in that. And so, you're playing Felicia, you're playing her over, how long is it? Is it four decades? 25 to 57, yeah. Okay, so for over 30 years. I'd love for you to maybe illuminate a little bit on what parts of her character do you feel were constant through that, and which parts evolved? Oh, that's such a good question. Hi, everyone. This is Hi. so nice. Um, this is so cool, you <laughs> I just want to say unbelievably cool that you got this. Yeah, I mean, like, it's a big one, it's a big one. Can't be not playing that cool. Um, yeah, the, the, well, it's such an interesting question because I do think she went on a huge journey. And I um, I think when, we were so lucky because we had these amazing tapes of them being interviewed and also of them just being. So there was this. Uh, writer John Groom went and made a, a wrote a book called The Private World of Leonard Bernstein, and, and we had those tapes, these original recordings that he wrote his book on, and you could hear them being interviewed about their lives. But also, there was an amazing uh, dinner that he he put a tape recorder in the middle of the table at dinner um, in Italy on holiday in 1967, and pressed record, and it was just them telling the story of when they got married and and it, how it was just complete calamity, and everyone got really drunk and took pills and <laughs> and it was all and there was just tons of you know sort of capers anyway he, so you could hear them just completely being themselves but you could also hear them being interviewed um and i think what i was struck by was just how wry she was how she held herself how um sort of yeah held there was a sort of she was always sort of, there was a poise to her and an elegance that sort of went into everything and she was very, um, she knew her mind on things, and I think that was a constant in her life, because she always knew exactly how she felt about things um, outside of herself. But I think there was an element of sort of self-protection and self-delusion that kind of fueled her through her relationship. Um, but I, I was, re when, I, when I wanted to play her, and we had talked, I, I wanted to go back to where she came from, because she left, you know, she, her father was American, and her, but she grew up in Santiago, Chile, and she spent a lot of time coming to America. But she made the choice to move to New York as a very young woman, and I thought, what an extraordinarily courageous thing to do. And so she had that amazing courage. Um, so there were just so many facets of her personality that I think I just I could I could have just kept learning about her forever. 
The tapes, how often did you listen to them? Oh, every day for, I mean, every day, constantly. So, and we did the, you know, we had this incredible dialect coach, Tim Monick, and we would play them and listen to them. Have you worked with him? I have, yeah. Which is the best, yeah. best. Um, and so we would listen to them and, and, you know, work on them, and then I would just, we'd just have them on our phones in our heads all the time, and they were amazing. While we're on Tim Monick, uh, Bradley, I remember hanging out with you one day, you said, I'm gonna work with Tim. I said, weren't you working with him last week? And he said, oh no, he's been here for months. <laughs> so Bradley had a, how long, how long was he with you? Embarrassing. <laughs> it's not embarrassing. It's not, no, because this is what it takes to do what you did. Uh, we started uh, when I was still uh, finishing A Star Is Born. So we started in LA. <laughs> and um, remember you came I back. Came to, I came doing? over because I was there for wildlife. Not for the Oscars, but, but, but you know, the Independent Spirit Awards. Um, but we went over, I went over to the house, and uh, and it was Oscars weekend, and Tim Monick was there, and they were working on Lenny. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just lucky that he was willing to do that, and then we worked in, in, in New York. But you know, Lenny had five different voices, really, or three, two, and then we split it up into two, really, kind of, for the movie. Um, which is, as he aged, his, his voice went down an octave because of smoking and a deviated septum and all of the way he lived. He was an insomniac and had asthma. Um, and, uh, and there's all this, there's a great uh, audio of him leaving this message for Jerome Robbins that we put basically verbatim in the movie. And that was a wonderful template for young Lenny at 25. And obviously there's so much recordings of him talking when he was 50 and then as he got older, when he was in his late 60s to 72. Um, so we just had these wonderful pieces of primary source material and the voice to me in terms of acting is always the key. We, we've talked about this, you know. Um, when I first started acting, all I wanted to do was like, can I just be real on stage or in front of the camera? Can I just be me in the voice that I'm talking to you right now? Because you know in auditions, I don't know about you, but I'd leave an audition and my voice would be hoarse because I was so not connected to what I was doing. You know, and it's like a screaming scene or whatever. And I was like, oh, I've got to get in touch. But then, because I had the, the, the privilege of working for over a long period of time, I started to get more bolder in, in, in the, uh, wow, yeah, we're getting married. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that was good, yeah. That was, like, <laughs> not, that was great. <laughs> That's an aha moment, yeah. Yeah, as I got older. I, yes, ma'am, I am getting older. Um, and, uh, and, <laughs> and so, I started to, um, I remember Willem Dafoe came to our school and he was asked what, um, what roles he chooses and he says, I only choose something that scares me. And I thought at the time, well, I'll never do that because I only want to do something that I think I could possibly do. But now it's all about doing something that's absolutely terrifying, but you feel maybe deep down there's a place for you to connect with that character. And the voice for me has always been in the latter half of, of my career, the, the, the key. Starting, it started with American Sniper. That was the first time I worked with Tim, and then A Star Is Born and Nightmare Alley, and then this movie. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's where the, a lot of the work, but, but more than just the work, the, the thing that gets us through, I think, and all the people that were involved in the movie is enthusiasm and joy. That's really it. I mean, I feel like it was the same exact experience that I had in grad school with my friends working on Lie of the Mind or Hurley Burley. Mm -hmm. It was that same, just, that's all we wanted to do was work on it and do ridiculous things to like get into character and you know experiment and, it, and I, I don't know about you but it always felt like you know our parents aren't around so we could do it that was that's the thing about being able to direct it you're like there's nobody behind us <laughs> <laughs> it's just us we can do whatever the fuck we want <laughs> do you remember the moment when you were like oh the voice i've got it it's just in my bones do you remember that yeah moment? yes just, yeah it was after a long, long time. Yeah. yeah, and it was older Lenny came first, and then really? younger Lenny came second. Yeah, because it was trying to figure out creatively where younger Lenny would fit. And, and Carrie was a huge part of uh, ensuring that I felt, because it, it was high pitch, I was like, this is ridiculous. And you were like, but it did feel real, it was organic. I felt that that was the voice right. uh, based on that tape, and we carried that over to when he was a little bit older. Yeah, I would say it probably happened six months before we started shooting. Which was years after. So there's a lot of like, oh, this is horrible. Yeah. Right. I would call her often as as Lenny, and many of my other friends. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, no, you don't. You don't have it. No, we're close. Are you sick? What's going on? I'm also fascinated, as I'm sure everyone else is, about the physicality of both of the characters. Um, Carrie, I'd love for you to talk. You talk about that elegance, about her. I'd love you to talk about finding the physicality of her and maybe talking a little bit about the latter years with the illness and how you 
prepared for that? Yeah, uh, it was. I, th I think I, I think because we spent so much time feeling like we kind of lived with these people. You know, we l listened to them all the time. We read everything we could about them. We, you know, we looked at all the photographs. We talked to the kids so much that um, Jamie, Alexander, and Nina, um, the Bernstein kids, who were just amazing. They just gave us so much access. So I felt like we had. We'd spent so much time with the modley, but uh, but there was a part of me that thought I've never played a character over this span of time. Um, I'm going to have to make some sort of graph to figure out where. Do you know what I mean? Like people, the guy who was in um, All Quiet on the Western Front made a. Did you read about that? He made a graph of where he would be physically and emotionally because they were jumping all over the place, and he had to remember what injuries he had. And and I thought, oh, maybe I'll have to do something like that where I. But actually, I think because we had spent so much time with these characters, I, I was tracking where Felicia was by Bradley. Like, there was a... When I looked into a young Lenny, I felt young, you know, and when I was unwell, Bradley as, as Lenny and everyone around me on set was treating me like I was very unwell. So there was, like, I think the way that Bradley constructed it and the way that the set felt and the way the crew were invested I didn't have to, there was a lot of it that was just instinctive because of the way that I would be treated on set or where I would see my husband or my, you know, and, and that was informing a lot of it. Um, so it wasn't something that I had to, I wasn't sort of enormously conscious of. Yeah. Bradley, talk about the conducting. I know you wanted to be a conductor from a kid, right? And so in some ways this must have been literally like your inner kid's dream to play this. But, we, we talked about it a lot. I'd love to, for you to illuminate a little more about that process of learning to conduct and and learning to conduct like Lenny. Well, it, it, it was um, more, at first it was just about, yeah, always loving and conducting, but like Bugs Bunny, you know, you know Tom and Jerry conducting when I was a kid. You know, those wonderful cartoons, you know. I, I think I, I'm one of like, you know, millions of kids that did that, I'm sure. Um, and, then, and then in terms of this movie, knowing that we were going to, we learned on the Star is Born that if you record the vocals live, there's, it's pretty invaluable story-wise, and that was the same thing that we brought to this movie for the conducting that one scene in the church that we had. I knew that for us, hopefully you as an audience would understand what she's experiencing. Um, so that was the goal, and and I didn't know any other better way to do it than if we actually did it. So we're capturing it. Now, the London Symphony Orchestra certainly did not need me there to do it at all. So, but the, the thing I was trying to achieve desperately, and what you could see on YouTube from the 73 performance, is just the utter joy that Lenny had at communicating with the orchestra. And I spent so many uh, moments uh, with the New York Phil and, and, the, and, the, and, and uh, the Los Angeles also, with Gustavo Dudamel, and then in Philadelphia with Yannick Seguin, and, and Yap here at the New York Phil, they, they opened their doors to me. So I was always able to go and watch for the last, you know, several years. And there was just this incredible thing where I would sit in the wings where you could, everything's in profile. And it, it almost looked like a sound wave that were the, the, the movement of the, those conductors with the orchestra. And that's what we have to, that's what we have to get. And then that matched with joy. So it's just one element. So that was the thing about, I wasn't ever trying to mimic him because I knew that would be a fool's errand, but can I somehow inherently believe that I'm him doing it, do it live with this orchestra and, and communicate with them and communicate just that, that, that fearless joy, you know? So when I watched the back, I was like, I didn't realize my mouth was open. <laughs> I was like, but we only did it once, so. <laughs> we don't have the budget to digitally close my mouth, so. Uh, but there was something, you know, it, it felt very naked, you know, very naked, and, um, but it was beautiful, and I, and I felt like that, that's what it needed. It need, that scene needed to have, that it was just unequivocal that, that he's joyful in that moment, especially coming off of uh, the Thanksgiving fight where she says all it is is hate that drives him. I want to get back to that scene. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure everyone wants to hear about it. And so maybe teeing up to some individual scenes I'd love to ask you guys about. Um, how did you create this? I mean, this is an epic love story, ultimately. So how, before filming, did you work to create that, to create that dynamic and to explore it? I, I guess I'm asking as actors, but also as a director, how did you, how did that happen? 
Well, we all know, uh, you and I have both, both worked with Elizabeth Kemp, who has passed away, uh, but I learned from her this dream workshop in grad school that I found invaluable, and that I'd always done on my own for movies, and then I started to do with the other actor once I started to direct movies. So uh, Stephanie, Lady Gaga, was the first person, and it really did bond us in a way that made the movie possible, I thought. And then, so I knew right away, and I spoke to Carrie about it early on, and um, Elizabeth had passed away, but your teacher, Kim, uh, what's her last name? Kim Gilliam. Gilliam, yes, Kim Gilliam, who's fantastic, had done Dream Workshop with Sandra Seacat, so they all had sort of funneled from the same place. And we spent six days, I think that was the cornerstone of our connection. Because we'd always known each other, and um, she was, it was so wonderful to have Carrie during the writing process of the movie, because we would read scenes, but it wasn't until we did that, certainly I didn't feel like, completely free with Carrie until we had finished that because we I had certainly never explored uh, creatively in ways that I would you know if you told me that 10 years ago the expressions that, that you witnessed I don't think I would ever say I would be possible to do that yeah without giving anything away yeah well we had a thing where we were like we did it at Bradley's loft and we were like what happens in the loft it stays in the loft yeah <laughs> so in broad strokes, in those six days, are you a mixture of, of of you guys as well as the characters, or is at some point you just sort of drift off into the characters? How does it work? Yeah, it was. It was a mi it was really a mixture. It was a lot of um, you know, it's, it's talking about your dreams, and and so there's so you know, it's your subconscious that's connecting your subconscious to the work, and and within that, there's so much personal stuff, but there's also things that you do discover about. Lenny and Felicia, and particularly about their connection. And, and it's active, you're doing exercises, like yeah, Lost yeah, in the yeah. Trail as an yeah, adult yeah. and a child, uh, in, as yourself and the characters, and it ends in a ritual that you perform for the other person, like a 20 minute thing that you create, and it's usually to music, and there's props, and the costume, whatever you want to do. And that's sort of the final element of this gift you're giving to the other person and to the work. Yeah, but the day before wow. that we did, we went up to Fairfield. Yeah, we, we did. Yeah, we yeah. went to the house, well, which is in the film, which is their house that they still live in, or you know, and we went and we and we spent the day there and we worked there. We did the the same work, but we did it in their house. And then Kim um, was like, "Now just go around, go around the house, and you're Lenny and Felicia. Just go and do some." So we just wandered around the house for a couple of hours, and we just and found ourselves chatting in the living room. But we were them, and it was. And it was, um, I mean, I've, li I've never, I'm English, I've never done anything like this before. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and before I was like, oh God, this is going to be, um, but it's mad, you just find yourself, I was, I mean, he, you know, and I was like, I get to work with Bradley Cooper, I get to act with him, I get to be direct by him, like, I'll do whatever. Um, but I, and I was scared shitless, but actually it was, it was, um, I, I kind of couldn't get my it was just made the world of difference in so many ways. I, I have worked in the past with Elizabeth um, and done that work myself as, as Logan, as lots of characters. I've never done it with another actor, but you can feel it, you can see it, you can feel it leap off the screen. Um, okay, there's so many scenes I want to go to, but the, one of the first ones that comes to mind is the post makeout scene, that first scene with your feet up on the bed and you're lying because you've got the bad back. Um, and I remember you, I think we were caught up on the weekend just after you finished shooting that scene. You said it, it sort of went differently. So explain a scene like that. How much of that is scripted? How much of that is ad-libbed? How much of that do you know as a filmmaker how you're going to shoot it or how much is on the fly on the day? Uh, so it's a great question um, because uh, the thing that I really learned as a, I mean, as an actor, all we want to be is calm, right, and open and, and relaxed. And I realized that even as a, a writer and a film and a director, it, it's the same principle. Um, and because of this incredible actress who has put in all the work and is Felicia on set, I mean, it's just, she is her, that's who it is. Um, we had a wonderful scene, but um, right before uh, I, I said, I'm gonna make, I, I was thinking about it, I'm also in a makeup chair like four hours before crew call, so a lot happens <laughs> in that time. I changed a lot of stuff. Because <laughs> I'm playing through, I was like, oh, we should be, because the whole thing, there was so much joy, and they always played games, and I was worried that this one scene that we wrote wasn't gonna make it, and it didn't make it in, so I wanted to make sure there were games, so I asked you to play a game when we, when we sat, and then that number game came from Carrie, and then this idea of, how, does, how is he going to, I was always gonna say that thing about my father in that scene, yeah. but I thought, 
how can we get to it? You know, and the best way for him to get to it is a game, you know, Envy and Secrets. <laughs> so I just made up this game awesome. that she wasn't aware of, you know, on the day as we're sitting there. Because I always knew it was, I was going to try to do it, you know, one shot coming over, which was always going to be, the, as written, the transition from the dance scene, you know, with the sheet and them, and then you go over the feet, you're there, and then hopefully just at the end, two, two cameras covering them, and then we're out. Right. So <clears throat> I knew that we had, and because also she's so incredible about rhythm, that we could talk to each other and we and I could stay in the shot because it's alive, like in, like in theater, um, and that just it, it lends a level of uh, reality for us, you know. Like I actually asked on her, and I I knew I could ask her if I asked on her, and she wouldn't say, well, "What what? That's not the line." Right. Did you know what I mean? And right. Instead, in fact, it's just immerse ourselves even more deeply into the moment, and that then it's really thrilling because. You've created this structural, uh, the confines cinematically, and then you're like letting these people, human beings, characters, they'll just free within this structure, and it's, it, uh, that's what I find the most exciting. I keep forgetting. I keep forgetting. You also had hours of prosthetics every day. It's sort of amazing. Kerry, it must have been so unusual to see a man in the makeup chair hours before you. It must have been great. <laughs> he also, he also. There's. It t takes that long for him to get ready before, and then to be there for crew call. But then right. at the end of the day, it's another hour and a half to yeah. take it off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Kerry, for you, if you wouldn't mind, I really would love to talk about the Thanksgiving scene. Oh, yeah. Uh, which uh, my friend directed the movie told me it was the third take, right? Yeah. Uh, the third take in the wide shot, but if you had not planned to do any coverage. That that was the plan? That was so, the dream. Okay, got it. Yeah, uh, I didn't know if we could pull it off, but because um, there were two things I was hoping we could do, which was, you know, make the whole scene, uh, the punchline be Snoopy. Yeah. You know, if we could do it. Yes. And, and the joke works best if you stay in that shot. Yes. Um, and then luckily on the, that was an example of the day, I was like, we need a setup for the, for the joke. And, and Snoopy was the, the, the you know, set deck had the Snoopy, I was like, ah, that's it. You know, it's upset, because he wanted to hopefully connect Lenny to Snoopy. But then it was, but I had like in my head, we were gonna set up two shots to do coverage if, if everything failed. But, you know, again, she drives the whole scene, as you saw, and and because of that, that's the only reason we were able to stay in that wide shot was because the actor was able to just blaze through a four-page scene effortlessly, and next thing you know, the scene's over, and there's no need to do it because the emotion's so true. Yeah. Uh, I, it could be the way I was with my sister and my parents fought as a kid. That was the genesis of that scene. I was always most scared being far away listening to a fight. If I'm in the middle, I wasn't in the middle, you know, looking at my mom and at a close up and at my dad. That I felt like if I did that for you, you would feel safe and know it's a movie. But if I put you where I was, at least as a kid, that didn't feel safe to me. And that, that was the hope. Carrie. Yeah. yeah. For you, that must be one of those scenes, as you said, the character so poised, and here you could feel the years, the decades of frustration of unsaid things and out of all came. It was extraordinary. I, I'm, I want to hear from you how that day went, how you felt, how much anticipation you had for the scene, probably from the moment you read it, um, up to that. And at the same time, I want to protect you if it if you just like, it, it exists and you don't want to talk through your process. But I think as an actor, I'm, I'm fascinated by how you managed to traverse that day and that scene so brilliantly. Oh, thank you, that's so nice. I mean, the first thing is that I got this incredible piece of writing, you know, sure. um, which was the first thing that Bradley ever sent to me. Yeah. So I think really? the first thing he wrote for the whole movie wow. was that. So I got that in like the end of 2018. Yeah. Um, so I had this, and he screenshotted his computer and texted it to me. Um, and I was literally I was putting my kids in the bath, and I was like, oh my god. Um, so it's such an incredible piece of writing. Um, and so I was so excited, and we had, we had read it a million times. We'd, you know, we'd, it, every time we'd read the script together, but we'd also tested it when we did a big camera test. So we, it, I felt like we had those words just right at the tip of our tongue, and and so I don't know, I don't know if I enormously. It was the last thing we shot in New York in that in that main chunk of shooting, um, 
But I don't think I, um, I don't think I built it up any more than any other scene, except that I was excited to do it because it's such brilliant writing. And I also, it was the, we had shot almost the entire film, so I'd lived all the things that were fueling that anger, you know. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was just a blast. It's the best thing in the world when the camera's like there and you don't have to, you know, especially when you've done theatre, you're like, oh, great. Because yeah. no one's filming us. And Kevin Thompson, our production designer, made this incredible set. And, uh, and we did the first two takes, which were a different version of that scene, but just weren't, weren't where it was. And then, and then this is what Bradley would do the whole way through the shoot, is that he would note, there would be notes, but not really, it would be, it would be more subtle than that and more kind of holistic. He would, he would change what Lenny was doing to make me change what I was doing. So his performance would, he'd alter his performance to make my performance different. So on that third take, everything about what so he says i drive the scene and then i you know i shout a lot but but what bradley did as lenny informed everything that i did so every you know when he, he i remember that he like walked in with the sunglasses on holding a carton of milk <laughs> and i went oh <laughs> and, and he bumped into the sofa and i was like you <laughs> like everything he did in that tape just took it to the next level of like and I was like oh now we're gonna fight and then, um, and then we did and we had this enormous fight and it was just uh, kind of brilliant I loved it <laughs> what is it what is it like here? Um, after this I have one more question so uh, uh, but I would love to know what it's like being directed by your co-star the best. I mean, the best. I mean, I don't know. But in general, maybe it's awful. But for me, it was the best. It was it, because it wasn't. There was no separate hats being worn. He was just. He had done the work, and also he is talented enough as an actor to pull it off. That's the other part of it. Like you can prep as much as you like, but his innate. I mean, we were at this Santa Barbara thing the other day, and they showed clips from Bradley's career, and I. I literally just wanted to watch all those films again. Like his before, every time you work, it's just. Yeah. So just you know, it, it makes your job so much easier when you just look into the other person. You're like, I believe every single thing you're doing. I don't need to do anything. And that's what he did, and then directed it all. I, I think you said it perfectly. It's what I've always seen in your work, in both of your work, actually. There's just a level of truth that is undeniable from the moment you, you're on screen. And it's, it's, I think, actually the demand for truth and your love of the truth. I know Bradley really well, and I'm, I don't you, know you as well, but I feel just from watching your work that you have that sense in your life as well, both of you, that love for the truth and, and that, that your search through acting is actually for that truth. So I, I kind of want to finish with a question that it comes from having worked with Elizabeth Kemp, who did some of these dream workshops and, and with me, and she would always sort of open the invitation to you as an actor to ask the character to almost meld with your spirit, with your psyche. And so I'm wondering what you, each of you have learned from Felicia or Lenny that you take away in your life. Be bold. Yeah, it was impossible not to be. Uh, it's funny you say that about acting because this experience, the only other time I really had, there were moments in American Sniper where I just felt like I was not there at all. And I had just opened it up enough for Chris to come in, Chris Kyle, who was based on a real person. But not since The Elephant Man. I didn't feel that in The Elephant Man for Joseph Merrick. But it was different because it was a play. Um, but I really didn't feel like, um, because there was that moment every morning, the truth is that makeup time, that prep before crew call was a blessing for an actor, an absolute blessing. And it was that moment of, still, you know, hours of stillness as this, this physical thing is being put on, this, this costume, this, this thing, this shell. And then there was a moment where I, I, had, I then had to take that leap of faith, which was guided by the voice as the key. I would go in behind the curtain, get dressed, and then come back for them to put the sort of, if it was a half a wig or eyebrows on. But I always made the choice to jump off the cliff in that moment and for Kazu Hiro to be Lenny. Because I was going to have to be Lenny the rest of the day directing the movie. Um, and that 
leap felt like me letting something in, not me acting. And, and I was terrified every day of the 54 days whether he would come in. That's what, and I would even say to him, like, I hope he comes today because we're fucked. Because <laughs> 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 if I'm thinking about like what I'm doing as an actor, the whole machine's gonna break down, right? right? And um, and he he came in and and because he came in all of those days and especially that last take in Ely Cathedral because he wasn't there the first day. That was the only day where he wasn't there because I was just so riddled with fear and tense that I wasn't open. Because um, I was scared of making a fool out of myself. And the only way I know how to act that the best one can is if you just have to absolutely be willing to make a fool out of yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, so what he taught me and what the experience taught me more than just him, working with Carrie, the crew, this film as a lived experience was just keep being bold. That's it. And, and then if you look at Lenny, that's clearly how he created and lived in so many ways. Mm -hmm. and, uh, being bold is what you've both done uh, in this film. It's clear, it's obvious, uh, and uh, you've been bold in your careers, in your choices. Uh, it feels odd. For me to say I feel proud, I mean not for you Bradley, because we're, we're such good mates, I'm incredibly proud of what you've achieved as a director in this film, as a producer, as a writer, but for both of you, your acting is extraordinary. It's an inspiration to all of us in this room and anyone watching. Um, it's just a level of class. Thank you.